Let's continue. So last time. We talked about primitive closed geodesics, primitive closed geodesics. Uh, I was about to call it gamma. Yeah, okay, we can call them gamma. Well, let's not call them anything. Primitive closed geodesics on the unit tangent bundle of the modular surface, which is the same thing as G mod gamma. G is SL2R, really PSL2R. Gamma is SL2Z. PSL2Z. And we saw that these were in one-to-one -one correspondence with primitive conjugacy classes of hyperbolic matrices. In other words, hyperbolic conjugacy classes of hyperbolic elements. Uh, well, now I'm giving them a name. So M is a hyperbolic matrix in SL2Z. And now we have the the class. Okay, and I want to make one more, uh, I want to add one more uh, correspondence here, which is um, uh, binary quadratic forms, binary uh, equivalence classes, classes of binary quadratic forms. And this is indefinite. Uh, good thing I left some room, indefinite. You're, you're remembering, what are you looking back for? How? I forgot we talked about quadratic forms. Well, we didn't last time. So this, this was what we're adding today. Oh, okay. Okay, so, so remember how we looked at, uh, if I have an element G of SL2R, G is just some element of SL2R corresponding to a point and a tangent vector, then uh, we, we looked at this flow. It had a, a positive visual point and a negative one positive meaning, visual meaning, this is what you see as you, as you look out at infinity, and a negative one. And, uh, and we saw that if we take the geodesic flow at time L, if we get to exactly the same point up to SL2Z, so this was equal to some M times G, right? If there's some M that sends this point back to where you started, then this will just be a closed geodesic. Great. And uh, I'm just reminding you how, how we saw these things. And then these, these points, alpha and alpha bar, were the fixed points of M. So M is a hyperbolic transformation. It moves uh, things along this, uh, the action of M moves things along this geodesic and along rays uh, sort of, they're not parallel to it. They're, they're sort of, uh, anyway. I have a question. Yes. So. The action of M, I mean, M is like a fixed matrix. Yes. And it's in gamma, which is like SL2Z. Yes. So like it doesn't act, it's not like there's a parameter T I can vary and act and smoothly flow along. It's not as, yeah. So M is not a smooth action. Oh, but the T comes from somewhere else. The T comes from, yeah, the, the geodesic flow is smooth, is a flow. And M is just what does it do to one happy face? Well, it moves it over here. Okay. Moves it along uh, these kinds of trajectories. Yeah, but like M like jumps it along. It jumps it along. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So so this point under M gets moved, or M inverse rather, I guess, gets moved to that point. Okay. And so things nearby get moved to things nearby. All right. So uh, primitive conjugate classes of hyperbolic elements. So this was the picture, and M and alpha and alpha bar were the fixed points of M. So M fixes alpha and alpha bar. And we saw that that means that alpha was uh, negative, is it D minus A plus square root of trace squared minus four over two C. I don't think we need to redo that calculation. I think I am remembering this correctly. Okay, great. Now let's talk about binary quadratic forms. So if Q is a binary quadratic form, given by you know, ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared with discriminant d, b squared minus 4ac. And this is, I'm assuming, positive and not a, a perfect square. So the q doesn't factor over the rationals. Uh, this also has a fixed point or two, alpha, which is the, uh, you know, the solution with you set y equal to one, um, the root of that 
a quadratic polynomial in X, which is negative B plus or minus B squared minus 4AC over 2A. When you have two real ones that correspond to the real ones, you have to. So now D is positive. Did you say square root? Uh, not a perfect square. Okay. Not a perfect square. So if D is a perfect square, then the fixed points are actually rational numbers. So this quadratic form factors. And then if, you, if you're interested in understanding representations of a number, if the quadratic form factors, then you're basically asking about the factorizations of that number. So that's a completely different uh, type of question than the irreducible ones over Q. Okay, so these are two, these are two real numbers, just like these are two real numbers. And the game to play is how do you go between them? What's the process that gets us, let's call this a sub alpha sub q, and this is alpha sub m. So, so here's the game. Uh, given, what should we do? Given q, let's find an m, or given m, let's find a q, which one? Exactly. <laughs> given, uh, let's say m, given m, find q, and vice versa. So that's sort of how we saw, I mean, originally we saw primitive closed geodesics. I mean, well, okay, this we discussed last time, but this direction uh, will similarly have this correspondence. Okay, so, well, what should we do? I mean, the, the simplest thing to do, let's go in one direction. I don't know which one. Let's say we know M, which one's gonna be easier? Actually, uh, knowing, yeah, let's say we know M. So let's go in one direction. Given M. Going from M to Q, I think, yeah, it's considerably easier than. Yeah. What should we guess for B? Well, guess, let's call this, let's call this B0. Let's guess that B0 should be D minus A. Right? The, the thing about Q is that it needs to be primitive. So we can assume that A is positive and that the GCD of the coefficients is uh, one. Right. Okay, we can, uh, in, in an equivalence class, we can always make A positive. And uh, we can assume that, I mean, if they have a factor in common and we're looking for representations, then we'll only represent those, exactly those numbers that have that factor. So we may as well just divide out by the GCD. Okay, so B0, we're going to pattern match B0 to be D minus A, D0 to be trace squared minus 4, so A plus D squared minus 4, A0 to be C, and well, uh, what is C? So D, D0 should be B squared minus 4AC, in other words, C should be B squared minus D over 4A. Okay, but we said B was going to be D minus A, and D0 is uh, A plus D squared minus 4, and we're dividing that by 4A0, which is C. And now this is pretty easy. Um, D squared, so this is D squared minus 2D AD plus A squared. This is A squared plus 2AD plus D squared. So with that minus sign, the, the cross, only the cross terms remain. And what we, what we get is, uh, and this is a minus minus 4, so we get 4 minus 4AD over 4C. The 4s go. The 4s go. 1 minus AD is negative BC. So divided by C, we just get negative B. Okay. And the only thing potentially wrong with this A naught, B naught, C naught is that it might have a GCD. So let S be the GCD of A naught, B naught, C naught. Yep. So again, this is the GCD, GCD of C, D minus A, and negative B. Then we almost get the form we want. Q will be 
the form a naught, b naught, c naught divided out by divided out by the common factor. This will indeed be a quadratic form, but there's something wrong with this quadratic form. It's very subtle. So, right. So we talked about trying to make A positive. Um, we could try to make C positive by, it's, it's related to that. It's related to the positivity of A. Uh, M is in uh, PSL2Z. And this is a function of which choice we make. So one way to uh, make this not a function of the choice, let's see, I think I can do this now. There we go. Okay. So one way to make A not a function of the choice, you see, if I change M to negative M, S is a GCD. GCDs are always positive, but all of these signs flip. So I need to undo the, the sign flip and I'll do that by putting some some function uh, some function of um, the sine of m somehow. And the easiest way to to catch it, I need something that I know is not zero. I don't know if, if uh, a, b, c, some of these things might be zero. C can't be zero. Why can't c be zero? Because then d is a perfect square. Um. If little c, yeah, uh, uh, little c from the matrix. Oh, okay. Sorry, I was thinking about capital C. Yeah. Um, so it, that's actually the same. I mean, it's it's the same reason. Uh, uh, Leonidas is is right that c zero can't be zero because then b would be zero. If either b or c is zero, then we have an upper triangular or lower triangular matrix with ones. That's the only way you can have a diagonal with ones or minus ones, which means the trace is not is not bigger than two in absolute value. So this needs to be hyperbolic. Hyperbolic. So I know that the trace is bigger than two. So if I put the trace here, the sign of the trace. So I'll put the sign of the trace of M and that will, that will ensure that uh, whatever this is, it's a function at least on PSL and not on SL. Okay, so um, that's our map from M to Q. How do we go backwards? So this is the M to Q direction. So now we've gotten a quadratic form. And the whole point is that the, by construction, the alpha of, of this Q is the same as the alpha of the M that we started with. How about the other way around from Q to M? We assumed M was primitive. So we did not assume that M is primitive in this in this and construction. If, uh, and I guess my problem would be is a non-primitive element going to get the same quadratic form. Yes, which is why if we which is why we should restrict to primitive. Okay. That also makes the first direction hard. How does that be to primitive? Right. Yeah. Right. Usually that is what happens. Just trying to anticipate. Yep. Yep. So let's start with Q. Okay, so Q has this. Uh, so we so we're given we're given Q is a naught b naught c or a a b c. How do we construct a matrix that matches this? Well, uh, we need the trace squared minus four. We need what do we need? We need a couple of things. We need the trace squared minus four is, well, it might not be D. You see, there could be some, some common factor here that gets canceled out. So we need trace squared minus four to be D times some square. Let's say S is the factor that gets canceled out on top and bottom. Actually, that's pretty much what we did. We, we called it S last time in the other direction. So if S is the factor that gets canceled out on top and bottom to make this fraction, we can make trace squared minus four equal d times s squared. We can make 
D minus A. That passes is very suggestive. It's very suggestive. <laughs> we can make D minus A be equal to B. And we can make C. Yes, thank you. So that we uh, exactly we're dividing through by that factor S. And we want to make C equal to A, A S. So if we get these, if we can solve for A, B, C, D satisfying this, then we exactly um, come up with our matrix. Okay. Now here's where primitivity is going to come in. Well, what is this? So we saw this means that the first thing, the first thing means that uh, we need to solve the Pell equation, solve TS in T squared minus DS squared equals four. Fantastic. Which solution do I want to take? The primitive one, because that's what will get me a, uh, the, the, the fundamental solution, the smallest solution, because that'll get me a primitive temp. So take the fundamental solution. Then like in practice, Which requires D not to be a square, by the way. Yes. And then in practice, how do you know you're taking the fundamental solution? Well, uh, because you know how to solve this equation through the continued fraction of root D. Then how do you know that that's going to give you actually? Because for, if it were one on the other side, then like, yeah, doing the continued fraction would definitely do that. But I remember there being like some. Slight complications with having that four on the other side. Yeah, it's it's a very similar process because I, again, when you divide through by s squared, you're saying that t squared over s squared minus d is four over s squared. So you need to be within. There might be some value, some some rational approximations that were, that are within one over s squared. Like it, it's actually easier to solve. It's like I mean, it's it's basically equivalent. Basically equivalent. You run through the continued fractions of root d, looking for fractions t over s, so that this uh, so that this difference is four over and s. And the fundamental solution may not come from the one that we get from t from, squared minus d s squared equals one. That's right. Right. It might come it, from another. There might be another smaller solution. Yes. So that will certainly give a solution if you can solve one and then double t and s. That'll that'll solve four. Right, but that might not be good. But that might not be the smallest one. Uh, so this has to be treated with a bit more care. I guess. In the process of solving, uh, you check the fractions from the continued frac from the continued fraction expansion. You go along the length of the continued fraction expansion and find a solution inside there somewhere. Oh, so you're saying it would have to be in there. Yeah. So the solution to you might miss the solution if you. The solution to this, uh, again, when you have a solution to one, if you double it, that solves this. That might not be the smallest one. Right. So in other words, as you were solving for one, you missed some earlier solution because it didn't solve four, it only solved one, that you would now pick up along the way. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? I'm not saying this oh, very well. So, so you're saying like, okay, try to solve it equal one. And once it hits, you have like a bound for how many partial quotients you'll have to check? Or are you saying that the smallest one would have appeared before? The smallest the one for four, for four would, have would have already appeared as you're checking for one. So as you're checking for one, just check for four along the way, and then you'll find it. Oh. I'm saying the process of finding these is, is identical. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because it's no that, harder than, so, than solving it with one. Because of that four over S squared approximation. Yes. Uh, so this has to do with sort of like the best approximations and like things yes, like that. and the and the exact constant of the best approximation. Mm. Okay, so so we take a fundamental solution. Well, now we know what t is. That means we know we know t. We know t, so we know uh, a plus d. We also know b uh, d minus a. We also know d minus a, which is supposed to be b times s where that S is, is the S that we got out of this fundamental solution. So, so these two together tell us D, but they tell us both A and D. If I add, I get T plus BS over two. And if I subtract or alternatively A plus D has to add up to T. 
So A had better be T over two, T minus B S over two. Right, the sum of these two is T, uh, the difference is BS. And now we know A, uh, and now we know C. C is A times this number S that's already determined. The only thing we don't know is D, uh, sorry, the only thing we don't know is B, is determined by and which is determined by AD minus BC equals one. So one is equal to AD minus BC. Uh, A is T minus BS over two. D is T plus BS over two. B is what I want to know, and C is A times S. And you, solve. And you just solve it. Uh, in fact, it's, it's rather pleasant. This is a difference of squares. So I get T squared minus B S squared over four. The B gets squared as well, right? Yeah. The B squared, thank you. Uh, minus B A S. So if I move the B to the other side, I have B A S is equal to T squared. T squared is four plus D S squared. Mm -hmm. Four plus D S squared. D by the way, uh, D by the way is B squared minus four A C. So this is T squared got replaced by four plus D S squared, S squared got, D got replaced by B squared minus four AC. Then there's a minus B squared S, that's all over four, and then a minus one. And the minus one cancels the four. Exactly, the minus one cancels the four. The minus B squared, thank you for catching that, at that square <laughs> cancels that. Yeah. And now I have a four over four. four. So I have a negative ACS squared. And of course I'll cancel an A and an S. So B is equal to negative. S is not zero because you're asking for a non-trivial solution. Exactly. S is non-zero because uh, uh, two I mean, comma zero is not a loss. Factor out of the, the square root, factor of the square root, the square root minus four. Can't factor in zero out of that. Right. If, if S is zero, then trace squared is four. And I want trace to be hyperbolic. Right. So, so, yep. <laughs> so negative CS is the answer. I divide off one of the S's and I divide off the A. That's the capital C. And so our matrix, now we know what the matrix is. Uh, the primitivity is the fundamentality of this solution. Right. How, how do we see that connection? So um, you'll so when you take powers of m, you'll see that it's the same uh, shape except with uh, other solutions. Okay. So what you're saying is that if I take this matrix, somehow it's going yeah. to encode other solutions of this poly n equation. So any so, uh, where where do we use the fundamentality of the solution? Actually, never. We never use the fundamentality. Right, so it has to be due to this. Right. And then, yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Right. So A is T minus BS. B is negative CS. Uh, C is AS. And D is T plus BS over two. So in fact, any solution to the Pell equation gives us a matrix like this, which has the same alpha. So the primitive one is the one that, that takes the fundamental T and S. So then who's to say there isn't this strange matrix out there that is a power of this one? Ah, um, right. There's a, a power of some other strange matrix. Right, so you'll see that in, um, if there were, then you could take that matrix, go back up here and make a Q out of that matrix, And uh, well, that Q would have the same alpha. So that must've been this Q. In other words, the fact that we have maps in both directions. Has to force the primitivity of this matrix. That's one way of seeing it. Now, let me leave you an exercise since this is something. So here's an exercise that, that might help uh, 
Well, this always annoyed me when I was trying to uh, do the math for those quantities. Yeah. So, so let's make that an exercise. Exercise. This M is primitive. Here's another exercise. If I take the, um, if I take Q, what I want to know is that this is uh, equivariant with respect to like, I want to take not just hyperbolic matrices, but classes, conju hyperbolic conjugacy classes. And I want to take not just uh, indefinite binary quadratic forms, but equivalence classes there. Are. So, um, right. So if I take the M, um, how shall I do this? If I take the M, the M that comes from not Q, but Q composed with some gamma, that is the conjugate. And I don't know if I got the inverses in the right way around. Uh, that is the conjugate of the original M. Okay, so this is, so they're compatible. Does that make sense? So if you have an equivalent Q, you also have an equivalent M and vice versa. And if you have a Q of an equivalent M, that's. Who first observed this correspondence? Oh, that's a good question. This is a very strange correspondence. You know, it's like a, you're taking two objects that are look hardly related at first and then you're. Uh... That's a really good question. Um, I don't know to whom to attribute. It's certainly in work of Selberg. Does it appear before that? Maybe Artin? Like people are studying closed geodesics. They're studying the connection between closed geodesics and, um, well, in the trace formula, this pri these primitive conjugacy classes uh, occur uh, and, and their correlation to uh, closed geodesics uh, occur. So that's why I'm saying Selberg. Um, does it appear before that? So Artin was already looking at the cutting sequences and noticing the relationship to the continued fraction of these alphas. I don't know. It's a great question. So yeah, it's exercise. It's really it's a jump from the cutting sequence then to the Pellian equation, right? That makes uh, yes. this sort of connection complete. Yeah. Uh, who, who found these first? Who found <laughs> these first? And then, um, Tell me, <laughs> please. And then another question I have is, uh, why were people studying closed geodesics just out of curiosity? Like, oh, we have geodesics in the hyperbolic, you know, Russell 2 z It should be possible yeah. that you get some closed ones and that was a good enough reason or was there some other reason for one? No, so uh, closed geodesics are a fundamental, I mean, uh, closed, so when you have a dynamical system, like the geodesic flow on some manifold. Um, in general, when you have a dynamical system, the chaotic dynamics is uh, usually, one feature of chaotic dynamics is that the periodic trajectories are uh, dense. They can approximate any trajectory. Any trajectory can be approximated by a periodic one. So think about dynamics on the sphere. If you're on the sphere and you start going in some direction, well, you immediately close up. You just go in a great circle. Right. Right, uh, that's not going to be dense. The periodic trajectories are, are not dense because uh, in the space of all curves, there's no way to approximate some curve that's that's, curve uh, that's random. Right. Okay. Whereas um, uh, it, it doesn't approximate any uh, geodesic. You're saying it's because it's not chaotic? Or right. So on the sphere, on the sphere, the dynamics uh, are not at all chaotic. You just every every orbit is closed. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's write this down. So uh, compare. And this would be seen, for example, in a dynamical systems class, or what is a yeah intergodic theory? You you want to study you know long term behavior of a dynamical process. What happens over over some time? The simplest thing is that it comes back to where it started oh. and does it again. Okay. So what you really mean here is sort of ergodicity. Of geodesic flow, yes, is uh, what you're like really making reference to here. You're right. So on a sphere, every every uh, trajectory, every geodesic is closed. On a torus, so this is negative. This is positive curvature. 
uh, curvature positive on a torus where the curvature is zero. So a torus you can think of as a, a unit square. What do we know about the trajectories? The rational ones are closed. The irrational ones are dense. Okay, so uh, rational uh, slopes are the closed closed geodesics, closed orbits, and the uh, irrational are dense, dense orbits. And so uh, this is this is zero curvature. And so now in hyperbolic space, which is like higher genus, yeah, uh, the curvature is negative. So this this is covered by hyperbolic, uh, the universal cover is, is uh, negative curvature, constant negative curvature. Then what happens to close, what happens to the trajectories of geodesic orbits? Well, some will be closed, some will be dense. Almost every, almost every orbit is dense, almost every trajectory is dense. Uh, but the closed ones um, still approximate. will approximate an arbitrary one. Really? Well, that's because what's an arbitrary geodesic, right? Uh, so uh, this is closed or trajectories, trajectories approximate, approximate any trajectory. What does that mean? Think about, think about this. Any trajectory is just uh, some map like this, right? It's the, it's the folding of a map like this. So if I have my upper half plane and you just dump it in there and it does whatever it does, it doesn't have to close up at all, right. but it's completely governed by the continued fraction expansion of this number, right? Uh, this is sort of like a density statement of like continued fractions in a sense. Um, yes, yeah. So this goes on forever. Well, I can periodize it to this length or I can periodize it to that length or I can periodize it to that length. Better, better. And those are all closed orbits which are doing a better, you know, for a longer and longer time, following exactly the same trajectory as this, as this alpha. So, so eventually they have, to, they have to separate. Because the visual points are gonna be close, but maybe not quite. Exactly, right? exactly. You know, you're saying the small adjustment in those visual points doesn't, doesn't ruin the... Uh... It eventually does. It eventually ruins things. But for a long time, they look like they're doing almost the same thing. They look like they're doing, they're having, you know, uh, if you think about lefts and rights, as they're moving along, if I see left, you see left. I see right, you see right. And then at some point we split. That's the thing about, uh, di uh, about diagonal flows as opposed to unipotent flows. Unipotent flows, uh, horocyclic flows, right? These parabolic uh, elements. The, the horocyclic flows, if we've been together for a long time, that if we've been together for time 100, then at time one, we won't separate by too much. Because there's polynomial divergence. As opposed to hyperbolic flow, we can be you know, right on top of each other for time 100. And at time one, we're super far apart. That's exactly what we're seeing here. So should it be surprising then that we can, these actually do approximate? Considering that they could. No, it's not surprising. Really it's not surprising from this point of view, but you have to have this point of view. Anyway, you asked why people study closed geodesics. Yeah, yeah, so this yeah. is sort of a, a bigger picture. So I just wanted to ask is the, um, the Taurus example, um, you're saying that's more like the unipotent case? Exactly. So would people still say that's chaotic or not really? Um, because uh, you still you still have like uh you know the rational uh, slope geodesics approximating any close any geodesic right yeah or, that's true it, it's uh it is typical no, I wouldn't call I mean there there is no formal definition of chaos that I'm aware of mm -hmm. there there are sort of features of chaotic dynamics so um certainly the fact that, so there's this beautiful Ratner's theory of unipotent flows tells you that the closure of a unipotent flow will be algebraic. Um, mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? In, what, in, in this uh, example, you can see it immediately. The closure is either uh, just some finite sequence of lines that close uh -huh. up and go back to where they started, right. or it's dense, so the closure is everything. 
Either mm -hmm. way, the closure is either the, the two torus or a circle. Mm -hmm. So these are nice algebraic uh, things, whereas the closures of uh, on this chaotic dynamical system, the closures can be, like I said, they can be fractal because you can do whatever you want <clears throat> here. You can approximate one geodesic in one direction and in the other direction, you can approximate a completely uh, unrelated geodesic. In other words, uh, by controlling these, these partial quotients, by having the freedom to pick whatever partial quotients you want, and you have that freedom because you just pick your favorite point here and a favorite point here and connect them and that's your geodesic trajectory. And every geodesic trajectory is like that. Well, that means you can make it go like this and then, uh, you know, like that and, and, and so on. So th this is what I mean by the, the closures could have any Hausdorff dimension. Uh, you know, you can, you, can, you can have scarring, you can have uh, the closures, you can have limits of closed geodesic that uh, accumulate on some random sets. Okay. It's very closely related to what I want to I want to get to. So the but the torus um, still has this approximation by closed geodesics. Um, but the number of closed geodesics, yeah. There's also you know uh, the the preponderance of uh, closed uh, trajectories. You you're right that rational slopes approximate in some sense approximate. Uh, there's a limit to how much they can approximate. Um, okay. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm just it, trying to it's slightly more subtle than, than that. Oh, okay, yeah. No, thanks. I think that's that's yeah. nice. Okay. Yeah, the, the term chaotic is uh <laughs> there's no rigorous definition, like it's something it's something that people just talk about. And then like um so what you're saying is say there's some problems that were important in hyperbolic space and your geodesic might be infinite, and then you might say okay, let me approximate it by this close to that's like this easier to work with. Is that like a kind of thing that people do? Um, not really. Not really. So it's, why do they want to know that this is like dense? Oh, um, well, just from the point of view of uh, these questions are much more general. What I was trying to say is the, the questions, I mean, this, Studying the closed geodesics on the modular surface is a very special case of understanding, in general, closed trajectories of dynamical systems. Um, to see where do we have ergodicity, where do we have uh, strong mixing, weak mixing. So this is really just uh, yeah, of interest to the field of ergodic theory. That's right. That's right. That's right. And we're bringing these questions down into the setting of number theory, where we have a whole lot more tools to, to try to say something. Interesting. I mean, this is why, you know, Lyndon Strauss got the Fields Medal for uh, arithmetic quantum unique periodicity. Uh, Rudnick and Sarnak had conjectured that on any uh, negatively curved surface, the, okay, we didn't talk about what quantum periodicity uh, means uh, and quantum unique periodicity, but um, that problem, whatever it is, is wide open in in general systems, physicists still don't, don't have any idea how to how to attack it. Some of them don't even think the conjecture is true. It's unique ergodicity that you only have one right. There's a unique stream point, and that's just your yep. ergodic measure. Exactly. There's one. There's one ergodic measure. So any limit of measures, uh, if it's invariant under uh, the flow, well, we'll just go to that. has no other choice but to go to that. And then quantum. Uh, quantum is in which sense do you take the limit? So it's that you uh, discretize by the Laplacian. And for large eigenvalue, you expect to see uh, par measure, which is supposed to be the unique invariant measure. Interesting. So, uh, and so, so arithmetic quantum unique ergodicity says that as you do this along not just arbitrary states, but the Hecke states, <laughs> then, then we can uh, prove that the limits are indeed only har measure. Hecka states, as in like Hecka operators or some other things that are simultaneously eigenfunctions, not just of the Laplacian, oh, but the Laplacian okay. and uh, the Hecka operators. Now, conjecturally, the Laplace spectrum is already simple. And so you shouldn't need uh, to then further decompose it to the Hecka states because the Hecka states, you, you have one dimensional spaces. 
that's what simple means. That's, that's what simple means. means. Yeah. yeah, each of the eigenvalues is, is uh, has a one-dimensional eigenvalue. We don't know that. We don't. We have we're very far from proof. <laughs> so anyway, this is a, a a very long story, but it's actually very relevant to uh, what I wanted to talk about today. So I don't mind taking the detour. Yeah. E L M V. Yes, we're getting to E L M V. Very, very slowly. Duke and Duke. Yes, that's exactly where we're headed. Be just before that, uh, let's finish. Why we're doing? Oh, we. I wanted to finish proving the finiteness of class number. Yes. Which obviously Gauss did by other means, since none of this was was invented yet. So let's prove. Uh, I mean. I don't want to stop the discussion, but we're headed in the direction of this discussion. So let's pause it. For as well. That's exactly that's exactly right. That's exactly right. If we don't do this, we'll be in trouble with the. Uh, yes. So this is Gauss again building on Lagrange and Legendre. Uh, uh, is that the class number is finite? So remember the class number. We, we remember what the class number is, right? The number of equivalence classes of binary quadratic forms of this discriminant D. We had proved this when D was negative. Now we're proving it when D is uh, positive and not a square. So we're not in the upper half plane all of a sudden. We're not in the upper half plane. What we had done before was you just move whatever your point is, whatever this uh, alpha is, you move it into the fundamental domain and you're done. Uh, now, what are you supposed to do? Because there's no, there's still an action. There's just uh, a fractional linear action on, on these, uh, Points, but the points, there's no way to move them into a fundamental domain. They're on the real line. What are you supposed to do with them? Exactly periodic. That's 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 it exactly. Yeah. So question? No. Um, the proof, uh, well, let's let's make a definition. Definition Q is reduced if alpha sub Q is greater than one and alpha Q bar is between zero and negative one. In the conjugate. The conjugate, the Gawa conjugate. It's between zero and negative one. So that's why I keep drawing. I mean, I sort of instinctively draw the pictures like this, but uh, but really what I want, uh, now let's be a little bit precise. Alpha is bigger than one and alpha bar is between zero and negative one. Okay, and the exercise is that this is equivalent to alpha being exactly periodic as opposed to eventually periodic it's exactly periodic as you said before you can eat away digits by even amounts right that's right that's right so you can do this with uh so you can move uh what, what you just said uh eating away digits eating away digits by matrix by our favorite matrix types and even words in these matrices uh, means that you can do this uh, implies that every class has a reduced representative. Every class has a reduced representative. Nick, I'm losing it. I'm going too fast. Okay, so that's what we want to prove. That's that's how we'll prove the finiteness is that the number of reduced representatives is, is finite. Now, unlike the positive discriminant, uh, unlike the positive definite forms, which have negative discriminant, so unlike D being negative, these are not unique. These re reduced, reduced what is not. Confused about, I guess, is that you're dealing with this quadratic irrational, which means you're going to be eventually periodic. So once you have it exactly periodic, then there are only finitely many like letter. That's right. Combinations you get, right? That's so right. That, like, good enough. It's it certainly is good enough. So even without this, uh, even without worrying about. Whether the unique, whether the reduced ones uh, are unique or not, if there's finitely many reduced, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. you're done. Okay. You're done for the finiteness of the class number. If you want to actually evaluate the class number, <laughs> how do you check if some of the reduced ones are equivalent? Right. You want to get down to the the minimal set of inequivalent ones, right? So that will be exactly that. Every any time you have a reduced guy, well, if you shift it by two, so uh, okay, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. 
But the point is, this is equivalent, uh, equivalent to a two, a three, a l, a zero, a one, yeah. periodized. Yeah. Right, because I could, uh, depending on you think, depending on whether you think about eating away digits or adding digits to the front, you can add a two, a three, a two to the front of this. Sorry, you can add well. No, now I want to think about eating away. Uh, this is also equivalent to uh, a l minus one, a l a zero periodized. So now I can I'm adding a l to the front and I'm adding a l minus one to the front. Um, you can do this as many digits as you want. But a one and two is over a l zero. Yep. Any, any cyclic permutation gives you an equivalent thing. If it's an odd length cyclic permutation, it's a comp it's to make that uh, you need to multiply by an odd number of these matrices. So they're only GL2 equivalents. So, so they're, these are quadratic forms that are uh, equivalent. There's the class number in the wide sense or in the narrow sense. Right. So we're doing the narrow sense of SL2 equivalents. So those will give us inequivalent. That's right. That's right. If there's an if the period is is uh, even, then those will be inequivalent. If it's if it's odd, then then uh, translating by an even amount will eventually get us to also being able to translate by an odd amount. If the period is seven, and I can shift by twos, yeah. then I can shift okay. so that a one is at the front oh, instead of a zero being at the front. Oh. Oh, I see, I see. Whereas if you have an even period, then you won't be able to get everything. That's right. And that is actually equivalent to when the when t squared minus d s squared is equal to negative four is solvable. When this period is, is odd. Okay, never mind. Never mind. For, but do you say this is relevant for computations of the class number? Is what you're saying this is relevant for? Yes. If you want to pin down exactly what the class number is. But not for the correspondence that we did before. Not for the correspondence. The correspondence, we didn't have to look at negative four as a solution, right? That's right. That's right. For the correspondence, we were just looking at, at four. If you if you want to work out the entire, um, OK, so class when I said solution. fundamental unit, yeah. there could be a smaller unit if, neg if, if the t squared minus ds squared has a solution with minus four instead of four. Then there could be a smaller unit and then the fu smaller fundamental unit. And then the fundamental solution to the Pell equation with a four is a square of the one with the negative four. Interesting. And then the one with the negative four, is that like you can guarantee to have a solution? No. That right. only has that equation is only solvable if this period here is odd. Okay, so when that period is odd, then that has a solution and it induces a better solution into the uh, four case. Um, then the, so it's not that you get a better solution for T squared minus D S squared equals four. It's that the, um, group of units is slightly bigger. It's not just the, the solutions to four. You also have a solution negative four. And that gives you a, a smaller unit, a smaller fundamental unit that generates the full group. Interesting. So you're saying that the set of units for the minus four case is larger. Yeah, L let me let me finish this calculation, then I'll write down. Okay. Uh, I'll write down uh, this thing. So, where are we? Unlike d being negative, where reduced is almost unique. Here, uh, here there are there can be lots depending on the length. Uh, lots of um, equivalent reduced forms. Almost unique, it was because of the boundary points. Exactly, yeah. There, there could be some on the boundary that are, uh, un that are equivalent. Uh, here, there are lots of equivalent reduced forms. Doesn't matter if uh, we just need to show there that the number For need- everyone, they're finite. Exactly. <laughs> need to show that the number of reduced forms is, is finite. Reduced forms is finite. And this, of course, is very simple. If I know, so, uh, one is a lower bound for alpha Q, but that's negative B plus root D over two A. Um, zero is uh, negative one is a lower bound for negative B uh, minus root D over two A. Wait, and the, the 
the process that we're doing is right we're looking at equivalence classes of of, of quadratic forms right and then you're saying okay let's pick out the reduced ones yes right all the uh and then you're saying oh even if you're equivalent to a reduced one you don't know which one necessarily and then you say once you have finally many of those then you must have started with finally many options right so if if we can show that so every class has a reduced form if the number of reduced forms is finite then the number of classes is finite Right. Even if the bound for the number of reduced forms isn't an accurate count for the number of uh, inequivalent forms, inequivalent classes. Oh, okay. So you're saying for each inequivalent form, there are only finitely many, finitely many uh, reduced forms. Yeah. So uh, the number of uh, equivalence classes is bounded since each class has a reduced form it's bounded by the number of reduced forms uh, okay. then, so if i can show that this is finite that that means that the class number is fine okay and so so uh anyway in the interest of time let me let you finish this argument that implies that b uh what's the what do i get in the end b is uh less than root d or something it's a very similar computation. it's a very similar yeah. in fact Gauss didn't do any of this. <laughs> uh, it's this it's, Gauss did the same computation regardless of whether D is positive or negative. Right. Okay. So uh, B is bounded, and then uh, I'll, I'll let you. Wasn't looking at the upper half plane. No. Right. So he was just. Uh, well, he he did. I don't know that he was looking at the upper half plane, but the he gave the fundamental region that he gave, especially when D is negative, uh, is is equivalent. To the upper half plane, mod SLTT. So he, as good as, drew that fundamental domain, in my opinion. You mean he described like some constraints that were equivalent to. Uh, right. Even if he didn't necessarily have a picture in the lab or. Uh, right. Huh. Nick, something. Uh, um, I'm going to ask Okay. All right, so once we have the finiteness of the class number, uh, now I want to get to, I'll just, I just want to state Duke's theorem so, so that you're aware of it. So um, yeah, by the way, here's a, here's a problem that if you solve, uh, people will be very happy. So here's a conjecture. Um, I don't know how much we talked about this. Uh, so, so Gauss had conjectured, Gauss had conjectured that if D is negative, that the class number actually goes, actually grows. Yeah, we haven't, talked we haven't talked about that at all. This was proved eventually. Maybe, maybe I'll try to say something about this. It was proved. This is the during uh, Heilbronn, during Heilbronn phenomenon, Heilbronn principle, and uh, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'm going to say words because if I start. Uh, getting involved in, in the proof of any of these things. And the Landau is equal zero, which is a long story. And, and uh, my advisor, Dorian Goldfeld. So Goldfeld uh, together with, um, so, so there's an ineffective solution that we do know that this goes to, to infinity. In fact, so, so this- So you're saying ineffective as in assuming Riemann hypothesis and not assuming Riemann? Riemann that's right. It's false. That's right. So I, we don't know anything about the rate at which this goes to infinity. That's done by during Heilbronn. Um, we get the best uh, asymptotic rates, but still with no constants. And then Goldfeld, together with Gross Zagier, Gross, Gross Zagier, gives an effective solution to the, to the Gauss class number problem. Effective solution. This is just for your mathematical uh, knowledge, but we're not going to have time to go into this. Unless so there's a yeah. so there's a reading group on algebraic number theory and uh -huh. uh, i was they asked uh i might give a talk for them next week and i was maybe going to talk about this oh great oh, really? even though it's algebraic stuff so i mean just in case you need an excuse to save yourself time and move on okay uh, perfect but that's exactly anyway. what i'm looking for so uh perfect. yeah let's do it <laughs> so in this case it's solved uh gauss also conjectured 
that. So does this mean that they didn't have to depend on whether the Riemann hypothesis was? That's right, with exact constants, yes, with so numeric like, constants. Like, forget about it, we'll give a proof. Yes, but the rate system. is much worse. The rate is like a log. The lower bound for the class number is like a, a constant times log, as opposed to Landau's eagle, which gives you a constant times root d. So the class number should be growing like root d. And then you get log instead. Yes. Okay, but it's effective. Root d times an inex times an, a constant that can't be written down uh, is worse, believe it or not, than log with a constant of one hundred. This improvement is the mid eighties. So Goldfeld is is uh, you mean this improvement? Oh, okay. So this is like oh god, nineteen. Uh, help me, Lewis. Uh, teens, I'm gonna say. Teens, 18, uh, 1918, 19, okay, less than yeah, 1920. I'm kind of forgetting. The this Lindo I'm going to say is 1930s. I think that sounds right. And yeah. this is 70s and 80s. So this is like 76 or something, and this is 84. Yeah. So, oh, it's a whole beautiful story that you should go to uh, Lewis's lecture to hear. Yeah, yeah I'll try to indicate and finding elliptic curve of. Uh, yeah, they use elliptic curves. Kind of, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Before we knew the modularity of elliptic curve, we needed to find an, a modular elliptic curve whose L function vanished to order three or higher at the center of the critical strip. How in the world are you going to find such a thing? You don't even know the L function exists. Is an L function. You don't know it has analytic continuation, and you don't know. And yet, at its at its central value, it's supposed to not just vanish, but vanish to the high order. So this is what gross uh showed: is that the, uh, the the value of the derivative at the center is related to this pairing. Anyway, it's a it's a gorgeous. Uh, okay, Lewis is going to talk about it. I'm not. This is the theory is stuck. Uh, there have been some improvements, but not much, not much. Uh, this is discussed in Ivan Skrowski, this, this, this proof. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful story. Let me say nothing about it. Um, if D is positive, we know anything. what we conjecture is that HD is one infinitely often. So you definitely don't get the same. We definitely don't don't expect the same result. We expect the class. Yeah. So the so the lim inf of H D is one. Now this is known. This was proved by Dirichlet, proved by Dirichlet for certain families for um, in uh, non fundamental discriminants for a family of non fundamental discriminants. Non fundamental discriminants. What does it mean? What is fundamentality? Okay, so the fundamentality, I, I can't remember if we, if we said this or not. A discriminant is fundamental if it is the discriminant of a real quadratic field. But uh, that doesn't help if I don't define uh, what. <laughs> so um, it turns out being fundamental, so D is fundamental, is equivalent to something like, okay, it depends on if D is zero or one, mod four, if D is uh, one mod four, then it's equivalent to D being square free. And if D is uh, zero mod four, that means that D over four needs to be, what is it, two or three mod four and square free. Sorry, this isn't good enough for our purposes? It is good enough for our purposes in terms of the discussion. I, I'm giving an incomplete discussion of the, the principle of fundamentality. Um, so, so the real conjecture is that among the fundamental discriminants, is that this is also true, and this is wide open. So we uh, did it for non-fundamental. That's right. He found a family of uh, like I think it's five times a family times some squares. And why is reaching the gap so hard? Okay. Well, let's go all the way full full circle. So in this setting, if D is positive. Remember, uh, remember the class number form. This Dirichlet class number form, class number <laughs> formula. We had proved it if D is negative, and then it said that L one chi D, that this uh, this, this real character mod D, uh, 
when uh, at the at the edge of the critical script is exactly equal to some constant, I don't know, pi or something, times the class number over root d. That's what we proved. This we proved in this case. Right, now, now think about this. If the L functions are supposed to be of, of like, you know, uh, roughly of size one at the edge of the critical script. Um, in other words, they're not, they're not supposed to be too small. They're not supposed to be too large. That they're not too large is actually not hard to show. So you can show up our bounds at like log D or something. Uh, that they're not too small. Well, that's, that's what this whole story is. And if they're not too small, then if this is size one, then the class number has to be a size root D. Oh. That's this growth rate. And that's related, closely related to this L function having a zero just to the uh, left of one. So maybe, we, okay, I'm going to shut up now because Lewis is, I'm, I'm ruining Lewis's lecture. Forgetting that root D is, that root D kind of comes for three and that gives us a congestion for what, what a good guess is. Right. Um, in fact, this, this gives us a lower bound for the L function of one over root D. It, you won't ruin anything. It's just, you know, saving you time if you want it. Yes. <laughs> and I do want to save myself time because I end up talking too much and not getting to the, you know, I do think about what I want to cover and then, it's like, uh, what is it? Uh, oh, uh, the, the Zeno, the Zeno paradox. Oh, like There's like what I have in mind to cover and then we'll cover yeah, halfway. Yeah. So, okay, fine. Next lecture, we'll cover the other. No, no, next lecture, we'll cover another quarter. <laughs> and so we're very slowly converging to. Yeah, you can blame me for all of that. That's okay. With questions. So what we're going to prove, this is what I, what I uh, have keep promising and I will come back to the Dirichlet class number formula in the case of positive uh, discriminant is uh, again some constant, or maybe the constant is one, I don't remember off the top of my head. It's the same type of formula, a, h of d over root d, but there's an extra factor now, which is log epsilon d. Um, exactly, this is the fundamental, yeah, it's, it's almost the fundamental unit. It's the fundamental solution to, uh, it's either the fundamental unit or the square of the fundamental unit, depending on okay. if minus four has a Pell solution or not. Uh, it's a solution of like right. the and so now let's think about this. If the if the L function is supposed to be one, if you want, if I'm telling you that L functions at this at the uh, edge of the critical strip are supposed to be a size one. Okay, so assume you believe that. Assume you believe that there are no. Assume, I mean, the Riemann hypothesis tells so you. That. Yeah, exactly. For large d, so for large d. For large D, we want, we think, we think that this is, let's pretend this is of size one. How do you estimate log of epsilon D? Okay, that depends on the size of the smallest, what's, how small can the Pell equation be? Right. If the class number is supposed to be one infinitely often, if the class number, if our class number is one for large D, then we have the following equation, one over root D log epsilon D needs to be one. In other words, i.e. Um, yeah, root D log of epsilon D needs to be um, uh, something's, oh, I'm sorry, the, the epsilon D is in the wrong place. It's, it's HD times <laughs> log epsilon D. What we, what we can't do in the, um, in the positive discriminant is separate HD from, law, from, the, from the regulator. So um, yeah, one more little adjustment. Why are they called the regulator? Oh, um, uh, long story. Thing or... No, no, no. Um, <laughs> Yeah, let, let, me, uh, let me just try to push ahead. No, I'm sorry, I'm uh, very curious. <laughs> yeah, it's good to be curious, it's good to be curious. So, so what does that mean about this epsilon D? That means epsilon D needs to be of size E to the root D. So the smallest solution to the Pell equation, think about T, the smallest solution to T, the least solution to T is like E to the root D, absolutely gigantic. And that, that happens. Yeah, in practice, when you go and you know, these 
but these fractions become a huge very quick. Yes, exactly. But then <clears throat> what you're saying then is that since this hasn't been solved, it's hard to either either way. We do not know. So what's missing, what's missing is some principle uh, that shows how to create principle for creating creating huge fundamental solutions. Oh. Solutions to public equations. So somehow there isn't a way to say, oh, here's this family of these for which you know you're going to get really huge yes. fundamental solutions. What we do have is the exact opposite. We know how to how to make uh, very small, very small Pell equations. <laughs> we do know, we do know how how to uh, ensure how to ensure that D has small uh, a fundamental solution. And it's completely trivial. If you take D to be like a square minus four, so pick your favorite T, uh, T is 101. 101 squared minus four is a discriminant that will have a very small Pell solution. Oh, you just take like two one? It, uh, you take, uh, in other words, the, the, this um, regulator, this root number, this um, fundamental unit will be, uh, this means that t squared minus d is already equal to four. Right, yeah, so s and, equals one. So s equals one, so you have t comma one, where t is d plus, you know, square root of, this t is the square root of, uh, what is it, d plus four or something. So epsilon d, um, epsilon d is of size root d, is of order root d, not e to the root d. Insane. So you get exponentially wrong. <laughs> right. And if that's the case, then uh, then h d. If that's the case, if that's the case, then h d times log epsilon d over root d is supposed to be of size one, right? This is the L function at one. Yeah. Uh, but that's hd times basically one log root d over root d, which implies the class number is huge. I mean, over, <laughs> over root log d. So let's just call it d to the half plus little o one. Or minus little o one doesn't matter. So we know how to make huge class numbers in the positive discriminant case. We don't know how to make small class numbers in the positive discriminant case. And we and the conjecture is that they, they there's lots of them. Wait, so why should that even be the conjecture? Um, why should that be a conjecture? That's a good question. So uh, for one thing, we have something called cohen lenz heuristics, which tell us how often uh, we expect certain group structure in the class group. Right, like the class group that Gauss first yes. discovered? Yes, and in particular, the size of the class group. And so we can, we can look and see when we expect the size of the class group to be one, when the, when the group structure is expected to be one. And among the primes, it's like uh, 59 or something percent of the time we expect. So we have, uh, it, so if you look at the primes and you compute HD on the positive primes, the, uh, it's very close to the heuristics predicted by Cohen and Lenskin. Interesting. So. Um, That's a reason for why. A reason, yes. Why we should. Uh, Cohen-Lenskra heuristics. I'm just going to write these words. I'm not going to go into this. Since again, I'm trying to get somewhere and I see that there's seven minutes left. Um, so where do I want to get to? Okay, fine. Let's at least state Duke's theorem. Okay. okay. So uh, a theorem, Bill Duke, when he was here, if I'm not mistaken, early in, early in his career, so it's a Rutgers theorem, uh, based, <laughs> based on work of Ivanitz. Uh, also uh, Rutgers. Also, so it's funny, it's funny when the two of them were in the room, uh, Duke will say, you know, it's basically Ivanitz's theorem, but I, I made a few modifications. And when Ivanitz is like, you know, I had this, this uh, method, but I needed completely new ideas. And Duke 
So this is Duke's theorem. This is not my theorem. And, and so, you know, there's a love fest going on. Anyway, it's, it's Duke's theorem, uh, which says the following. So you look at these closed geodesics, look at closed geodesics, geodesics uh, of discriminant D, of discriminant D. So what does that mean? Well, there's a correspondence, as we just discussed, of closed geodesics to uh, hyperbolic conjugacy classes to uh, binary quadratic forms. Binary quadratic forms have discriminants, and hence we import that definite that notion of discriminant to uh, hyperbolic conjugacy classes and import that to uh, closed geodesics. So let me say that, i.e. You go from closed geodesics, geodesic to uh, hyperbolic conjugacy class, uh, hyperbolic conjugacy class to binary quadratic form class, class of binary quadratic forms. This we know what, what it means to have discriminant. So we pull that back to here and we pull that back to here. So now you can say what, it, what a that a closed geodesic has a discriminant. And really, these are going in reverse, right? You're, you're taking a binary quadratic form, then you go back, then you go back. If you like, you if you like, yeah, yeah. So you can take your class of binary quadratic forms. So this is your class, uh, uh, your your group uh, of forms of discriminant D. From each of those, you can construct your hyperbolic conjugacy classes, which gives you which give you a family of closed geodesics. These closed geodesics theorem. As D goes to infinity, the closed geodesics that can be distributed. The collection, the collection of these closed geodesics equidistribute. Which means that if I take a patch of the fundamental domain or so, and then exactly, exactly cover that percentage. Of exactly. So if I take my, my E, if I take a sum over the closed geodesics. Uh, well, really an average, one over uh, the number. This is going to have to be invariant under things in the same class, right? Because otherwise it wouldn't be well defined. So uh, let me finish writing it and then ask your question. If I integrate uh, the indicator function of being in this region A across these geodesics, so this is a, a geodesic in the class, so I integrate over the geodesic with arc length. So in other words, I want to know what proportion of time I spend in this region. So, it's, so that's this that's this thing uh, divided by the length of the geodesic. The length of it. So, so this is a normalized. Uh, everything's normalized. Uh, that converges as d goes to infinity to um, the in, the integral of a over h mod gamma divided by, again, normalized the volume of, of h mod gamma. Okay, yeah, so this answers my question. So you sum over every gamma in there because you didn't, then these wouldn't need to be well defined. Right. So let me show you a picture of this when you're, when you're done writing. So in so, the in yeah. same yeah. paper, he, didn't he also prove that the like quadratic thirds in the upper half plane equidistribute? Or was that already known? Didn't he like also for... prove? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, exactly right. Okay. The question was in the same paper, didn't he also do this for negative discriminants? And the answer is yes. So also, also, uh, as D goes to minus infinity, if you look at these Higner points, if you look at every quadratic form, the class number is going to infinity, as we just discussed. So if you look at these points, you sum over these points, let's call them alpha, in the class normalized by uh, the size of the class group. Uh, and then the indicator function of whether uh, alpha is in A. So I have these points, and I want to know what fraction of them lie in, in my set A. That also has the same, same limit. Is there any reason why we just think that they both equidistribute? Um, well, a generic, uh, 
so again, this is, comes from, in the case of the geodesic flow, we don't have a flow on points. So these Higner points, this is really a separate uh, discussion. The question is, where should these points, you know, if you have a huge class number, so you have lots of these roots, they're all in the fundamental domain. What should their distribution be? What should their large, large D limit be? You know, as, as you take Dirac spikes at each of them. Well, it should be hard measure. Hard measure is the only, uh, is the unique uh, invariant measure. Now, what's the flow here? Here, it's, it's much harder to see the, the flow. Uh, you have to, if you look at it adelically, then, then there is a, a corresponding flow. Um, in fact, that's what this ELMV paper was, was doing. In the case of closed geodesics, it's much easier to see what you're supposed to do uh, without going adelically. Because you're saying you're, you're just doing geodesic flow. Right. right. So now, a typical yeah. geodesic will already be distributed. What this is saying, now let's, let's remember something. Lots of, so this is as D goes to infinity. Lots of these are supposed to have class number one, in which case there's no sum. There's a single geodesic that's becoming a space filling curve and equity distributed. So, so that's exactly what I want to show you a picture of, and then we have to stop. So here's a discriminant D. Uh, 1337, which has class number one. Okay, and here's its one geodesic. You're saying you can find other big things for which it's going to fill even more of the space. That's right. As D gets larger and larger, you should be seeing x squared uh, dx dy over y squared. One over y squared is the hard measure. And look, there's more, it spends more time down here. And, and the proportion is like one over y. Right. Okay, you see this picture? as opposed to 1365. Now, why 1365? 1365 is, uh, where is it? So here's the fundamental solution, by the way, with 1337, with this discriminant, 1337, the fundamental solution is of size 2 billion. And this is the corresponding uh, matrix and so on. For, for the other example, for the other example is 1365, uh, which is, uh, is this Dick's theorem? The yeah, I wanted to say, I, I thought I wrote it here somewhere, but I don't see. If, if I, is 1369 a square? Square root of 1369, 37. Okay. So this is T squared minus four. So I know it's going to have a huge class number, relatively speaking. Uh, huge, uh, in this case, turns out to be four, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And here are the, the geodesics. So one geodesic just goes, this is, this is actually the identity element in the, in the class group. Uh, the identity element for these discriminants also always has to shoot all the way up and down. But then this is what you're saying in the picture up, that if you put overlay them all together, you expect something similar. That's exactly right. So one of them goes straight up and down. It's not equally distributed at all. Uh, then there's another one which is here, another one here, another one that's really low lying. They're sort of like, like taking paths and like right. covering different parts. But when you put them all together, if you were colorblind, if you if I grayscaled this, this picture would look very similar to that picture. Mm -hmm. That's exactly Duke's theorem. In the in the in the class group, individual elements can do all kinds of crazy things, but when you average them over the class group. They look just. They look. They look like they could distribute. So, regardless of whether the class number is one or root d. Okay, so that's what this. Uh, that's that's the beauty of this theorem. Now, let me state, uh, since we're already sort of like tying in equivalent. This theorem sort of ties in equivalent classes. So sort of what you're doing is like even though they are in equivalent together, they do something. That's right. Sort of, uh, that's right. There is a natural reason for these geodesics to be grouped together. Exactly. It's not just some arbitrary. Yeah, the discriminant really is a, a fundamental property of the closed geodesic. Well, okay. grouping things by discriminant. So this is a, a gorgeous theorem. Wild. Uh, <laughs> yeah, totally wild. All right, I'm out of time. So I'll. Um, is today Tuesday or Friday? It's Tuesday. So on Friday, uh, I will try to say something about the ELMB problem now that we have Duke's theorem, and 